The first time my father hit me was the night my mother left. I remember it like it was yesterday. His bloodshot eyes, the disturbing smile plastered on his face, and the spittle on his lips from all the shouting. And of course, the belt. I don't think I could ever erase the memory of that piece of leather as he raised it high over his head and brought it down in a burning slap across my bare arms. My mother had usually been around to protect Alice and me. She was our rock against the storm that was my old man, and his temper that was prone to exploding whenever we did anything stupid. It didn't take much to stop him, either. A simple threat of taking away the farm. A massive 100-acre space of land that she had inherited from her own father. It wasn't enough to stop my old man from carrying out his ruthless punishments. Looking back at it now, I, I believe I'd really taken advantage of that. More than Alice had. It was easy to get away with things, and there was no love between my parents for my mother to ever take his side. I never knew what had torn them apart. When the turning point in their 20-year relationship had come, but it didn't matter to me. For a pubescent boy whose father couldn't discipline, my mother was a get-out-of-jail-free card, and I abused it. Three weeks after my 13th birthday, I guess she had just enough of it all. I can still picture her last night at home. How she sat in her chair out on the porch, sipping her usual lemon iced tea, pretending that I didn't know it was something stronger. Off to bed, Garfield, she teased. She poked me in the belly that had awarded me the nickname. And despite the urge to remind her how much I hated being likened to an orange cat, that night I had let it slide. Sometimes I look back and wonder if maybe I should have spent a little more time with her on the porch. Maybe I would have known what she was up to and could have talked her out of it. But I didn't stay with her. The next morning, she was gone. Women are like that. I remember my father telling me while he rummaged through the closet, looking for God knows what. They're never satisfied. Now go wash your face and stop acting like a freaking baby. He was never going to answer the multitude of questions swimming through my head. And Alice wasn't much help either. Her mother's departure had obviously hit her hard. She spent most of her days numb to anything and everything around her. When she burned dinner, my father took his frustration out on her. I instantly regretted trying to stop him when the beatings began, and although they probably lasted only a few minutes, it felt like hours. It was almost as if he were beating me for every single mistake I'd ever done, making up for the years my mother had stood up to him. I think paid to the weeks that followed that particular day, and sometimes wish he had killed me then and there. The scarecrow came a week later. By then, the days had begun merging together, each the same as the other until I really couldn't tell which one had ended and which one began. At some point, I had to check the calendar to make sure my mind wasn't playing tricks on me, that a day truly had ended. It was proof that the sleepless nights I was experiencing, cowering under the covers while my father stomped around the house, drunk and angry, were finally over. The old man had started a reign of terror in our household. There was no telling what would set him off anymore. The smallest things igniting a fire so furious. He would burst into a blinding rage and a barrage of beatings. He would wake me at odd hours just to satisfy his urges, shouting and slapping until I was huddled in a corner with my hands up in defense, tears streaming down my face. The rising and the setting of the sun was not enough to let me know that I had survived another day. But if I thought I had it bad, and back then I truly believed I did, then Alice had been living a nightmare. She had been quickly promoted to taking care of the things my mother had once been responsible for. However, without the threat of losing the farm, my father could voice his disapproval a lot more physically than he had before. Some nights, I could hear Alice crying in the room beside mine, and although I would want to go and comfort her, I could never find the courage to do it. Other nights, I would cower in my bed, shaking and sweating, as my father stomped past the closed door to my room and barged into hers. She would scream, of course, shrill at times, muffled at others, and I could clearly hear the slaps my father would administer to her to shut up, whatever he was doing in there. A few minutes of listening to my sister's screams and my father's grunts seemed like a lifetime, and to this day, they haunt my dreams. 
The scarecrow was the only thing that seemed to break the cycle. I didn't know where it had come from or why my father had suddenly decided that we needed one, but it looked horrific. The first time I laid eyes upon it, strolling out the back door and onto the small yard between the house and the cornfields, it had stopped me cold, sent chills up and down my back. About fifty yards in the distance, crucified for eternity, it hung over the stalks of corn and stared right at me. I knew the notion was absurd, that there was no merit to how I felt the first time I saw that damned thing out in the fields. But those days, my emotions were in complete control over my mind, and no logical part of me ever considered speaking up and correcting the ludicrous imaginations of a teenage child. A pile of hay covered in my father's old clothes and my mother's Sunday hat. Still I could see that those eyes were directed right at me watching me, the smile drawn across its face with a black marker, aimed in my direction. Come out into the fields, Garfield. Just a little closer, so I can tell you the funniest thing you will ever hear. I have a few secrets to share. I'm sure you're going to want to hear them. Want to know why Alice screams at night? Definitely not beatings, kiddo. I decided to stop venturing out into the backyard after that. I don't remember exactly when the nightmares began, but I do remember it was after Alice was taken to the hospital. My sister had fallen into complete silence by then, going about her chores with the numbness of a psych patient. She was on cruise control, working off instinct rather than actually paying attention to what she was doing, and even though I was trying to talk to her, she would just look at me with an empty gaze. Whatever was left of her, Whatever could still be labeled as Alice was lost somewhere deep behind those eyes, locked away in a corner where, where my father couldn't get to her. She had slowly become nothing more than a walking corpse, and although it broke my heart to see her that way, there was very little I could do. It was the laundry, I think, that led to the beating. Alice had forgotten to empty out the pockets of my father's jeans had washed three hundred dollars there with the rest of the clothes. I had never seen my father that angry. Once the beating started, it took a very dangerous turn. Quickly, Alice had become apparently numb to my father's strikes as well, and the more she stayed quiet, the more she failed to react with every slap, punch, and kick, the angrier he got. It all came to a shuddering halt when he grabbed her by the back of her head slammed her face into the wall. The sheer volume of blood that was pouring out of her broken nose was enough to make me gag, and equally enough to snap my father out of his blind outburst. There were a few awful seconds of complete silence, only broken by Alice's gasps for air, coughing and sputtering, the blood seeping into the front of her shirt and turning her white blouse a dark crimson. Don't you move! My father shouted at me, suddenly overtaken by urgency as he raced about the living room and grabbed his coat. They were out of the house in minutes, driving away just as the sun was setting and a soft wind began to pick up around the house. I watched from the front porch, my hands buried deep in my pockets, and for the first time since my mother had left, I contemplated running away. I thought oft of it before especially after the worst beatings, but always knew that somehow my father would find me and the consequences would be severe. Now, though I had a head start, he would be far too busy making excuses at the hospital for Alice's broken nose, and I would have the perfect window of opportunity to escape. I had some money stowed away, enough for a one-way ticket to wherever the hell I wanted. I had no idea where to go or what I would do once I got there, but that didn't matter. What was important was getting away from here forever. I raced up the stairs to my room, closing the door behind me out of habit than anything else. The sound of the empty house a bit too ominous for my liking. A few of the lights had burned out over the past week or so. My father still hadn't gotten around to changing them. The dimmer illumination left shadows where none had been before, and it only made my urgency to leave stronger. I couldn't stay in this godforsaken place any longer. Thoughts of Alice suddenly crossed my mind, and the fear of what might happen to her if I left filled me. 
I stood motionless by the small desk near my window. My hands on the open drawer were $200 hid beneath my science book, awaiting to be retrieved and used. I couldn't do it. I couldn't leave her behind with that monster where his fury would go unchecked. This time he broke her nose. There was no telling what he might do next. The wind whistled through the tile window, and I closed the door with a shaking hand, frustrated and angry, knowing that I would be forever stuck in this house as long as that madman walked around freely. I thought of calling the police, but my father wasn't stupid. He would somehow find a way out of trouble. My mind raced with possible solutions, but nothing seemed promising enough. I reached out to close the window over my desk, glancing briefly at the cornfields behind. When I froze in horror, the scarecrow was perched in the backyard, hanging from its crucifix at an angle that allowed its hollow eyes to stare up at my window, its black smile wider. I didn't sleep that night, hiding under my bed, but even when I heard my father's truck drive up to the house, and the sounds of Alice's soft footsteps walking up the stairs and into her room. I don't remember when I had finally fallen asleep, but I woke up with a start when my father pounded on my bedroom door, stormed into the room, pulled me out from under the bed. Do you move it? He was shouting. You're good for nothing, piece of shit! Did you move it? He shook me so violently, my teeth rattled in my head. My words came out in stutters and gasps. He grabbed me by the collar of my shirt and dragged me downstairs and out to the back. I fought him, unable to break free of his grip, but terrified enough to know that I didn't want to be anywhere near that damn thing. The scarecrow was watching me with a smile. And when I looked up at it, now upright, as if it hadn't just been laughing at me last night, I felt my heartbeat race to a painfully thundering pounding in my chest. You carry it then! My father was screaming. You think you're funny? Big clown, huh? You're gonna carry it all the way back. God help me, or I'll string you up right next to it. I carried it. It was the longest 20 minutes of my life. To this day, I remember the splinters that punctured my skin as my father forced me to pull it out of the ground with my bare hands. I remember trying not to look up at its horrid face, that awful smile, as I leaned it onto my back. I remember the heaviness of it, as if it were carrying a sack of rocks instead of strands of hay. I remember my father barking orders as the sun's rays beat down at me, while I set the scarecrow back down in its regular place. The worst of it all was the feel of the hay against my skin, the straws stroking the nape of my neck, and the wind blowing through the corn stalks, as if the damn thing were breathing against me. I could imagine its smile behind me, its eyes boring into the back of my head, and for a split second I imagined its hands breaking loose from their ropes and wrapping around my neck, choking me to death as I carried it. My father didn't string me up next to it, but he did use his belt, and all the while my eyes kept seeing the scarecrow's face on his, laughing maniacally as I cried out with every strike. Alice didn't come out of her room the whole day, and I found myself suddenly responsible for her chores. I think I gained newfound respect for her only after a few hours doing what she had to do every day. Of course, my father was always there, breathing down my neck, quick with a slap across the back of my hand when he wasn't satisfied. But none of that fazed me. The memory of the scarecrow in the backyard, and the chore of carrying it back to its spot had left a lingering feeling of dread inside me. Stronger than anything my father could say or do, suddenly it felt like the walls of the house were closing in on me, as if I were being boxed in with no prospects of escaping. At night, I could hear Alice crying through the thin walls separating our rooms. Part of me felt like I was abandoning her, even though I was only a few feet away. I had no idea if I could comfort her, if anything I said could make up for the abuse she was experiencing and I was too scared to try. I heard my father's heavy footsteps climbing the stairs, closed my eyes when he passed by my room and into Alice's. Within minutes, the grunting began, and although I tried to block it out, it kept me awake until it stopped. 
Alice's bedroom door opened and closed, and I listened as my father made his way back downstairs. I climbed out of bed, shaking with fury, angered at my helplessness, ventured back to my desk and secret stash. The money would be enough for both me and Alice. I could get her out of here, away from the farm and my father. There was enough for two tickets, and I was sure that once far away, Alice would return to her usual self. We could both find a way to live out the rest of our lives without any problems. I looked up at my window, feeling my body being drawn to it slowly, dreading what I might see once I looked outside. I knew that the logical thing to do was crawl back into bed and try to sleep, but some sick and twisted part of me wanted to take a peek, make sure that what had happened last night had not been repeated. I needed to believe that it had been some sick joke played by a couple of drunken teenagers looking for a good time. The alternative was too horrible to fathom. I walked to the window in small, tentative steps, and as I drew closer, I could already see the cornfield beyond and the absence of the scarecrow from its crucifix. My eyes scanned the backyard, goosebumps breaking out all across my skin and a cold finger tracing a line down my spine. When I finally found the scarecrow, it was lying on the step of the back porch, its face towards the sky, and its hollow eyes staring straight at me. I didn't wait for a beating. At dawn, when there was just enough sunlight to assure that the shadows had been dispersed, but not enough to wake my father, I went out and carried the scarecrow back. I went through the motions quickly. My eyes fixated on the destination as I tried my best to ignore the straws poking out, stabbing into my arms. It was heavier than the last time, and after a few steps, I dropped it onto the ground, dragged it through the corn the rest of the way. It took me almost a half an hour to take the stake down, tie the scarecrow back on, and pull the whole thing back upright. By the end of it, the muscles on my back were screaming bloody murder. I hurried through the morning chores fixing breakfast just as my father walked into the kitchen. I braced myself as he stared at his eggs and bacon with clear disgust, before grunting and beginning to eat. Don't! He hissed at me when I took a second plate and made my way towards the stairs. She needs to eat! I replied. My father only had to look up from his food, and I trudged back to the kitchen table and sat down opposite him. If I had known it was his last day alive... I might have acted differently. I remember seventh grade English class, when my teacher was discussing a fantastical story about a boy who spent every night in the attic of an abandoned house playing with elves and fairies. The story was told from the point of view of the boy as an adult man returning to his childhood home, and how his memories turned out to be nothing more than a child's imagination. When I look back at that night, my father died. I wonder just how much of it was imagination, and how much was real. The day my father decided that Alice would not be fed, sitting at the kitchen table and eating his breakfast, was the day my entire world was turned upside down. It was also one of the rare days he didn't beat me just for the hell of it, although there was one moment in the late afternoon when I thought he would stick his fist all the way down my throat. I avoided Alice's room like the plague my mind selfishly content and excited that I would possibly go through 24 hours without having to endure my father's wrath. When I finally closed the bedroom door and crawled under the covers, a part of me sighed with relief. There might have been even a smile on my face, although that's one detail I could never remember. Everything else that happened that night is etched in my memory forever. It started with my father's usual trips to Alice's room, the stomping of heavy feet on the stairs and down the hallway, the creaking of a door opening, and the slamming sound of it closing again. And of course, the grunts. Although Alice had come to fall silent during the past few visits, that night her screams were shrill enough to make me jump in my bed and my heart beat like a hammer in my chest. Fists slammed against the wall over my head, and for a moment, I truly believed I would see hands break through from the other side. I jumped out of bed hurriedly, stepped back and away from the screaming and the pounding, 
from the angry shouts of my father and the sound of hard slaps coming from across the wall. My body shook uncontrollably. My eyes stared in horror at the wall separating my room from Alice's. Her screams cut through the still night as if she were right there in my bed, kicking and lashing out at the man who had been abusing her for the past few weeks. I felt frozen in place, unable to do anything more than listen to the sound of my sister's screams. Something hard slammed against the wall, and Alice's screams stopped. In the sudden silence that followed, my beating heart was like a drum in my ears, and I fought hard not to race out of my room and into the night, away from the house and the horrors within. That's when Alice's door creaked open, and through the wall, a shuffle of sheets and a flutter of feet followed. What is this? I heard my father say, his voice muffled clearly out of breath. Is this some kind of joke? How did you get in my house? I felt a chill race through me. For some inexplicable reason, I rushed across the bedroom and to the window. I gazed out at the cornfields, squinting to see through the fog that had begun to settle around the house, and knew what I would see before I saw it. The scarecrow was missing. The sound of my father screaming froze the blood in my veins. I'd never heard a man's cries of pain and terror so shrill before. And as I stared out my window, my eyes fixated on the empty crucifix where the scarecrow should have been. The screams turned into gurgling gasps of agony, followed by the sickening sound of breaking bones. A heavy thump followed, and the house fell into complete silence for a few seconds before I heard the sound of Alice's door opening and closing and the approaching sound of soft footsteps. I didn't turn around, my eyes gazing straight ahead through the window, my body beginning to shake uncontrollably. The footsteps stopped just outside my door and through the reflection in the window, I watched in horror as the knob turned and the door swung open slowly. The scarecrow trudged into my room and stopped once it was a few feet inside. I couldn't turn, praying that if I stayed completely still, it might realize I was harmless and leave me alone. I had no idea what it had done to my father, but my imagination ran wild with the lingering sounds I had been forced to hear just minutes before. My eyes were locked onto the reflection of the holes of its eyes. And for a quick instant, I saw a flicker of movement there. The hat on its head hung askew. Between the straws, I could see golden strands of blonde hair matted with mud. It spoke, and although its voice was horrifyingly muffled, as if it had swallowed sand, was trying to speak through mouthfuls of it. There was a tone there that I recognized. Off to bed, Garfield. He won't hurt you anymore. They found me out in the cornfields, unconscious and shaking. The doctors called it conversion disorder, a result of severe stress, and it took me years before I could finally speak and answer anyone's questions. They kept me isolated most of the time. It was only after I was able to communicate properly that I find out what had become of my family. Alice was dead, beaten so badly that the damage to her organs and the internal bleedings were enough to make sure she had found a permanent escape from the clutches of our father. I miss her. Sometimes I wish I could find some way to tell her I'm sorry. That there was no excuse for my cowardice when I should have been there rushing to save her. The monster that had been my father was found dead from multiple stab wounds. The police told me most of the bones in his body had been shattered by what appeared to be a baseball bat. If the stabbing hadn't killed him, the bleeding would have. They had found both weapons in the cornfield as well. My mother had never left either. She was found covered in hay and old clothes, hanging from a crucifix in the middle of the cornfield hidden in plain sight. She had been strangled to death weeks before, most probably by my father, 
and the police asked me several questions about their relationship in her last few days before giving up completely when I started to scream. I never really recovered from what had happened, from what I saw. Until now, I still wake up screaming, locked away in my padded room, the effects of the medication wearing off faster every night. Sometimes, when the lights are out and the illumination from the hall outside isn't enough to scare the shadows away, I can see the scarecrow standing in a corner, watching me with its hollow eyes. And each time, it would speak to me. Off to bed, Garfield. 